that doesn't really apply to me because I'm working on an in-house system for our seller, like for the sellers at our company to do uh, place orders and stuff. We're already married, they have to use my software. They don't have a choice. So it turns out that's when it's even more important for the good UX. Because every minute that your sellers spend in your system, that they don't actually have to spend in your system, but they do because your system is complicated, that's money lost by your company. Every time they can't place an order <clears throat> because it's simply too hard to figure out how to, that's money lost by your company. And every time they place the wrong order, that's not only money lost by uh, your company, but that's a customer loss to your sellers, right? So bad UX can cost a lot of money. I noticed, like first had in my, in my team, for example, uh, some of my teammates do a lot of admin in um, internal tools. And these internal tools, no one cares about UX. So they spend hours and hours and hours doing useless stuff that the system should be doing for them, like making it efficient to go from A to B. In fact, UX has very little to do with graphical design and stuff like that. Um, UX is often thought of something that some arts majors should do. Like not really as developers, we should be thinking about things like which dependency injection scheme we should use or how to architect a system. But it's super important to think about the UX part too and we're the people who can do that. So UX is hard because it's kind of a subjective subject. It's kind of like the touchy-feely thing. Does this feel right? Does this, like there is no patterns and practices when it comes to UX, the same way there are patterns and practices for how you should order your files in, in an Angular application, for example. But lucky for us, these guys, Steve Herbst and Mike Madlock, and they used to be UX res researchers at Microsoft working um, in the Xbox team. And what they did was they did a systematic approach to, to UX. Something that when I first saw it, it appealed really, I don't like it appealed a lot to me as a developer because it's very like step by step and, and not so subjective. It's, it's like very, it can, you can feel it. Feel. So what they did was they took about 100 years of user interface research. Obviously not all computer user interface research, but the research of the user interfaces of everyday things. Um, because it turns out that a user interface of a computer is not all that different to a user interface of, of any kind of machine or any kind of object. In fact, I'm gonna say, while I'm using um, a lot of Windows stuff in this talk because I'm from Microsoft, uh, this has nothing to do with Microsoft technologies or Windows or anything. It's just user interfaces in general. So what they did was they took all this research and they said, all these smart people that talk about user interfaces, what is it that they really are talking about? Like, what are the common things that they say a good user interface should do? And what are the common things that they say it shouldn't do? And they came up with a system called tenets and traps. Where tenets, there are nine of them and we're gonna go through them now. Um, a tenet is basically an attribute of a good user interface, something that all user interfaces should have. And then there are traps that are problems that degrade good interface design, and we're gonna take a look at some of them too. And to do that, we're gonna take a look at something that's not a computer, well, it kind of is a computer, but not in, in, uh, in the same sense that we might think of one. So obviously a self-service checkout system. And we're gonna go through all the tenets in the context of this. Uh, not necessarily really in the context of this, we're gonna get a little bit more involved and go to Sweden where this is our self-service uh, checkout system. It's actually, I think it has a better user interface. I think there's an echo. Let's see. Um, so, um, sorry. Uh, the first thing, so in, in Sweden the way it works is that you go to one of these stands, you swipe a loyalty card, and the swiping of the loyalty card is kind of important because not only do they make you do the work, 
that they should be doing, like the cashier's work, but they also check everything, like they kind of have a record of who you are and what you're buying, so they can send you personalized ads and stuff like that. So you're doing this for them, and you give a lot of, uh, give away a lot of data, but that's not what this is about. So you pick up one of these scanners, and then you walk around the store, scan the items, and at the end, you leave the scanner in the stand, and you swipe the loyalty card again, and you check out, you're done. So when you get to this, the very first time you're gonna use this, it needs to be easy to understand what you should do. It needs to be easy to understand that you should swipe the card, pick it up, it should be easy to understand how you should scan the items. So the first tenet is understandable. That's the first attribute. Because if it wasn't, what would happen is that you would never use this. Like, you would rather go to the cashier and, and, and have them scan the things for you. Or if they would have to have a cashier kind of explain things for you, it would be useless to the stores because then they would have to employ the cashiers to do the work anyways that they want to avoid for them to do. Now, each of these tenets, like understandable, is um, an adjective, and then it comes with a sentence. So when you look at this and you hear the sentence, like if you look at someone using your user interface and they say, oh, I know what I can do, then it is understandable. So that's kind of just explaining what this tenet is. If on the other hand, they say, I don't know what to do, then it's not understandable, and then you have to go down and look at what traps you might be running into and kind of try to avoid them. So that is the first of, of nine. The next one is that it has to be physically effortless to use this. If you're not developing a game, it should be physically effortless to use your, your software. Physically effortless meaning that if you know what to do, it should be easy to do it. So. <coughs> In the case of a scanner, um, the way you're going to work this is you're going to use the scanner in one hand. Um, you're going to pick up like a bag, start uh, putting things in and scanning them. So in the case of a scanner, you need to, um, you need to be able to do everything one-handed, for example. If you can't do it with one hand, like if it requires two hands, it just becomes too physically, um, too hard to, to execute it physically. Um, also, other things you need to think about in this case is like, for example, when you do scan, it shouldn't be hard to kind of hit the target, no matter what the lighting is and everything. So if it is hard, that's also not physically effortless. If you know what to do, you should be able to do it like super quickly. It also has to be responsive. Responsive meaning that, for example, when you do scan an item, it should give immediate feedback. So it should give off a beep or something. Because if it doesn't give off that beep, then what you're, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start scanning like two or three times because you don't realize that the, you actually did beep something. And you're gonna end up paying for you know, three cartons of milk instead of one, which is, it would be kind of annoying. Um, now, there are some things that take a lot longer than just like you know, the milliseconds in, that you need for the response. But in that case, you have to have some feedback telling you uh, that we're working on it. But for simple things, it should give immediate feedback. It should also be efficient. Efficient meaning that you should do things in as few steps as possible, or at least in as few perceived steps as possible. So in the case of the scanner, if you wanna scan like 10 things, um, less steps, might be scanning something, clicking on a plus sign, and typing in number 10 or a number nine. But that wouldn't be very efficient in this case because that would mean I have to change hands. So efficiency doesn't necessarily always mean less steps. It just means less perceived steps or more efficient in this case. It needs to be forgiving. Forgiving meaning that if you did something wrong, you should be able to undo it unless it's something that's like, you exploded a nuclear plant and you can't undo. But in most cases, you should be able to undo. Like for example, a perfect version of the, the forgiving uh, software is Word, where you can basically undo until you get to a blank statement. Um, so in, I've heard, because uh, I, I haven't actually used a self-service checkout here, but 
Uh, I've heard that if you do scan something twice here, you have to call on a cashier to, to undo. So obviously it's not forgiving. In Sweden, uh, with, the, with these scanners, you just minus scan if you, uh, if you happen to scan something twice. So that's pretty nice. It should also be discrete. Discrete meaning, for example, it doesn't overshare. So if you type in a password, it shouldn't echo the password back or um, a credit card number or something like that. Or if you do something wrong with a scanner, it shouldn't like beep really loud and kind of alert everyone else's attention. Or maybe, hey, the girl on mile five is buying a whole lot of, well, private stuff. Um, one way that it's not discrete, in fact, this uh, scanner system that we use in Sweden is, um, once you've scanned your loyalty card, you will get like a monthly statement coming back saying, hey, here's your bonus, and um, here's 25% off on, on these things you buy regularly. So sometimes when I go to the store, I like to like buy a um, piece of chocolate or two, just kind of get a reward for going to the grocery store. Yeah, you know. Um, my husband necessarily doesn't necessarily need to know that, but <laughs> um, we do get a whole lot of 25% off chocolate bars. Yeah. So that's not being discreet. So in some cases, like a typical case of not being discreet is like, do you remember the early days of Netflix where if you logged in with your Facebook account, it would pop up and say what movies you were watching on Facebook? Yeah, I'm glad they changed that. <laughs> so just be mindful of what you're sharing. It also needs to be protective. Protective meaning that I don't lose my data. Um, typical case where things are not protective is whenever you fill out a web form and then you go to the next page and then you decide, oh my God, I need to change something. You go back and suddenly the form is cleared out. Every single time, I have no clue why people do this. Like that is not being protective. In the case of the scanner, it turns out it is actually very protective. Uh, so one of my friends, uh, her name is Jessica, she does like a lot of our um, hackathons. So she normally goes to the store before the hackathons and buys like uh, energy drinks, hundreds of them, and pizzas and stuff like that. So she was out one time uh, buying all these things, and she was kind of in a hurry to get to the hackathon. And it turns out the scanner just turned black on her in the middle of the purchase. So she was like, really? Don't really feel like you know going about scanning all these things again. But she went to a cashier and asked, hey, I need a new scanner. She was really, really pissed. Um, but when she got the new scanner, the scanner had all her items on there, like so. That was uh, an example of a very protective system. So that's the kind of stuff that makes you go, ah, this is really nice. You know, and the things make you feel warm and fussy about a user interface. It also needs to be habituating. Habituating meaning that uh, once you've done something two or three times, you should be able to do it automatically. So the first time you go to the store and scan, you might be like kind of, did I scan something or how did this work? And you know, But the next time and the next time and the next time, it should be automatic and you shouldn't even be thinking about having a scanner in your hand. Um, typical things that are habituating is for example, if you put like the OK button always being in the right place because if you switch things around and you put the cancel button where the OK button is supposed to be, that always ends up in disaster. So you want things to be easy to habituate. And finally, the last one, and I'm not going to spend pretty much any time on this, but I'm just leaving it in there, is beautiful. Beautiful doesn't necessarily mean Mona Lisa beautiful in the sense like it doesn't need to, uh, it doesn't need to have nice colors and unicorns and stuff. It does need to look professional. It does need to be like need to look like you actually did put some effort into creating the user interface. Because if you didn't put any effort into making a nice user interface, how am I going to trust that you did put some effort into the security section or into the architecture as a whole? 
I'm not going to trust you with my credit card unless the system looks professional. So these are the tenants. And then they come with a set of traps. By no means are we going to go through all of these. We're going to take a few examples of the, the more common ones. Um, but these are the traps. And in fact, they look like cards because it is actually physically a deck when you're using it normally. Um, but you don't have to worry about that so much right now. So the elephant in the room is that we're missing one of the items or one of the attributes, which is intuitive. Everyone says that a good user interface needs to be intuitive, right? Intuitive meaning that you can do something just automatically, like without any conscious reasoning. We're going to do a, a bit of a user study, actually. I want you to, to stand up, if you will. And we're going to use a very intuitive user interface. So have any of you played Xbox with Kinect? No one? Not a single person, OK. Uh, PS Move, like you're using? Yeah, OK. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to raise your right hand and kind of grab, grab onto the blue, um, the blue box there. And then I'm going to display a second screen. And I want you to take us from this screen to the next screen with just a gesture, OK? Are you guys ready? One, two, three. OK? Pretty much everybody looked the same way, going like this. So it's a very intuitive user interface. You guys all knew what to do. Now we're going to take this one more time and go one, two, three. OK. <laughs> And that looked a little bit different. <laughs> Suddenly, it's not so intuitive. We'll do one more try. One, two, three. Yeah. OK, so you can sit down if you want to. Um, what happened there was um, or the reason, the reason uh, the, it worked the first time and it didn't work the second or third time, is because there are no intuitive gestures. There are only things that we have learned or we have yet to learn. So the only thing that you can hope for your software to be is easily understood like, or understandable. Um, in fact, the reason why the first one worked is because there is an equivalent in the real world, like moving things. But other than magic, there is no way you can copy things, like magic and a copier. But um, yeah, there is no gesture in the real world that goes to, to copying. So let's go ahead and, and, and go to the understandable part. Um, understandable is, um, has four different sets of traps. Um, it has perceptible, noticeable, comprehensible, and confirmatory. So the first one. Uh, perceptible means that if you're going to perform a task, let's say take a picture or something, is there something on the screen that will help you do that? Is there like a button, take picture? Or is there like it doesn't necessarily have to be something you touch, it could be something you hear or something you like, something you can speak or something. But um, is it on the screen? And the uh, the second one, the noticeable, is if it is on the screen, do you notice it? So for example, if you, if you go to um, a website and you have like the sidebars where the ads normally are, and you put something in there, you will probably not notice it because it's not in your noticeable area, so to speak. So perceptible, noticeable. If it is there and you notice it, do you understand what this is for, like what this button is for, for example? And finally, if you do something and if you get feedback, do you understand how to handle that feedback? So this is Windows 8, um, and specifically mail in Windows 8. Does anyone know how to search for an email in Windows 8? Yeah. So the way to search for an email is Windows 8, in Windows 8 is through the search charm. Very few people even remember this. Um, this is an invisible element. It was never on the screen. And therefore, it's like super hard for people to, 
to get it because what they did was basically they went in and showed you a quick video when you installed Windows 8, but my mom, for example, I was the one installing her Windows 8, so she never got the video and she doesn't, she didn't know how to, to use the charm spar, for example. So this is an invisible element. Um, and they fixed it by actually returning the search to the screen. So the reason they did this in the first place was because they wanted to do like a minimalized, like a min minimal user interface, remove all the Chrome, is focus on the content, but sometimes you can get a little bit too far. Um, but adding back the search fixes that problem. Now here's another minimal design. This is the Apple TV, um, or the Apple TV remote. Does anyone know how to fast forward? Okay, yeah, one, two, a couple of people. Um, so the way to fast forward on the Apple TV is by pressing in the top area on the right hand side. Also an invisible element. Again, a minimal design where, um, um, where you don't want to necessarily have it look like the regular remote controls with all the buttons because that's ugly. Um, and not only is, like once you, once you know what to do, it, like you'll remember it and it's good. Um, problem is that sometimes it's dark. So sometimes you don't even know which side is up and down on this thing. So there is a fix for that. Um, so this is an invisible element. And the fix is the rubber band. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, I want to point this out as an example of this is an invisible element and it's generally a bad thing to do invisible elements. But sometimes you have to make a trade-off and you have to think about like what is it I want to accomplish with this. And in this case they wanted to accomplish a really clean design, like a clean looking design. And the trade-off was the first time someone tries to fast forward they're going to fail. But the second time they're going to fast forward they're probably going to know how to do it because once you know how to push like once you know that this is a touchable area, it's good. So sometimes, not all traps are necessarily something that you need to fix. Now, this is, like if you hold up your thumb and hold it up in kind of this area, this is how much you can see at once. So the nail of your, of your thumb approximately. You might think that, man, I see a lot more. She's, Got like crazy eyes, I don't know. But it turns out that this is really how much you can see at once. And what your brain does is it kind of fills in the whole picture. Or it fills in at least a part of the picture that it thinks you need, you need because it works super fast scanning and putting it together. But our attention is limited and we decide which parts of the screen are going to be interesting at this point or which parts of the screen that we're not expecting to find like this particular item on. So, sorry, damn it. Okay. Hold on one second. Um, let's see if I can go to. <coughs> okay, we're gonna do this. Sorry about this. <laughs> I didn't want to start the video before I got to tell you what to do. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a video about um, uh, basically how our attention is limited. And some of you might, may have already seen this video, but I still want you to follow along and kind of do the tasks if you will. Everybody got that? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> and that too, yeah. <coughs> so 
So this guy, this is Michael Medlock, by the way, the guy who invented the system. I think, yeah, it's highly disturbing if you didn't see the gorilla the first time and <laughs> watching it the second time. So I'm not going to ask how many people saw the gorilla because I'm going to assume that about half of you who hasn't seen this before saw this. But how many people had seen this video before? OK. And keep your hands up. Now, out of you, all of you, like who didn't see the gorilla the second time? You didn't see the gorilla? <laughs> oh, no, that's it. Yeah, no, so no, I'm talking about like when you saw the video again, you didn't see the gorilla? Yeah. Okay, impressive. Because <laughs> normally, out of the people who had seen this video before, pretty much all of, all of them will see the gorilla because they know and expect it to be there. Why is this important? Well. If you're reviewing your own user interfaces, it means that you can't like unsee how to do the charms bar or how to do the fast forward and things like that that uh, new, use, new users will fail to see. So when you do review user interfaces, have someone else use them and watch them instead of like testing them yourself. But um, anyways, it, like you will always miss things that you don't expect to see. So this is an early version. This is like Xbox 360 and actually not something that went into to production even. But where do I go to search for a video in this? This is um, on purpose left blurry, kind of only showing the places where you focus. So normally, um, 90% of all people would focus on this section and expect to see the search here too. So maybe going into to the video apps, but kind of expecting to see some kind of search. Turns out that this is where you're supposed to, to do the search. In fact, pressing the Y on the, uh, on the control. This is called an effectively invisible element, just like the gorilla. Like it was there, but you didn't see it. Or some people didn't see it. So sometimes you can have things on the screen that no matter how many times you look, it will, like, they will not appear. So they fixed this by, uh, by adding in a search section right where your focus is. Where is this is um, Word 2007. So where is the print button here? So the expectation, um, at least for me and for I think a lot of us, is that it's supposed to be file print, right? But suddenly file didn't exist. Uh, instead, like you said, they put it on the system menu, um, which is an uncomprehended element because you're not expecting it to be there. And, and in fact, it doesn't even look like a button could be a, a logo or something. And they fix this by putting back the file. So if you've conditioned someone over years and years to do something, don't go around changing it. It's <laughs> stupid. Um, they fixed it even in, like, in an update to, uh, to Word 2007. This is... Um, an iPhone, I think maybe iPhone 1. Um, where do you go to listen to music? So I heard someone saying iTunes. Um, turns out, say what? IPhone. Yeah. So you would kind of expect to go to iTunes because that's the music notes and everything. So, but it is iPod. So this is the case of something that looks right but is wrong. And the trap here is something called an inviting dead end, which means that you're going to always try to, well, unless you actually know what to do, uh, you're going to always try to go into iTunes and never find it. Sort of like, and, and if you never find it, you're just going to look more in the iTunes section. You're not actually going to go out and 
and kind of wander around the other ones. So they fixed this too um, by changing uh, to a music section down here. Now I should point out that basically everything that I'm showing here are things that are considered pretty good user interfaces to begin with. So these are your small flaws. I'm, I'm intentionally not putting things in here that are considered super bad user interfaces, but just to show you that even like people that are really good designers still do a lot of a lot of weird decisions sometimes. Now, what is this? So this is uh, a wash basin. <laughs> and the reason you know that is because there is a sticker on it, <laughs> right? If you have to put a sticker on a wash basin, <laughs> I think you're doing something wrong. So for guys, this is an inviting dead end. <laughs> and for women, it's an uncomprehended end. <laughs> yeah. So you see, it kind of transcends to, to non-computer things too. Um, so we've got an election coming up in, in the States. I, I don't know why I'm saying we, because I'm not in the States, but um, there was an election in the year 2000. And I'm not sure if any of you recall what happened, but it was basically a, a, a battle between Gore and Bush. A lot of people thought that uh, Al Gore would win. And then there was this third guy, Pat Buchanan. And he was, I mean, he didn't get no votes, but he didn't get like a whole lot of votes, except for in Palm Beach. Um, and it wasn't like he was campaigning, doing all his campaigning in Palm Beach. This was due to one of the biggest UI flaws in, in US history, I would say, um, the Florida butterfly ballot. Have you guys heard of this? So the way this worked was, if you wanted to vote for the Democratic Party, you were supposed to click, like people who, who voted for the Democratic Party would click here because it seemed logical. They should have actually clicked here. But instead, by clicking there, they managed to vote for Pat Buchanan. So this might actually have lost Al Gore, like the POTUS position, right? Um, so bad UI or a bad UX could mean, yeah, it could mean pretty, <laughs> bad things, um, if, if I decide. Um, so this is called poor grouping, when the grouping kind of like makes it hard for you to see what to, what to do. Um, another example of this, uh, mute to call. So clicking this button maybe? No, this one. So, um, or this. <laughs> This happens all the time. You've probably seen like there is a radio button over here and a label over here and yeah. Like so this exists everywhere. Um, and then there is the confirmation. So if you get feedback, you should, it should be actionable feedback. Um, like this one, for example, in PowerPoint. So I know exactly what to do. I open up my debugger and I figure out why there is not enough. But uh, yeah, my mom, probably no. Um, so these were some of the traps um, in the understandable section. Now, this was a really long section. Don't worry, the other ones are not going to be like that. But understandable, habituating, and efficient are some of the, like, if you were to rank these uh, attributes, those three would be like the, the more important ones. Um, Physically effortless um, has to do a lot with targeting and readability. So, to make some like to make a non-physically effortless user interface, you would have really small buttons that no one could reach, um, or you would put, for example, a red text on a green background, preferably with the background scrolling, or something like that in super small font. Um, but if you want to have a physically effortless user interface, you would make sure that people can read, even if you're doing something on a larger screen, make sure the text is bigger, make sure the contrast is nice, and, and that the buttons are actually targetable and things. So this is me playing one of my favorite games, um, Lego Star Wars. 
and I would like to sit in the sofa and play this game, but I really can't read anything on the screen. Like, the figurines are super, super small. So, this game is not physically effortless. This is also an example of another game that, until the update, was also not physically effortless because pushing this retry button, which you had to do a lot, was pretty much impossible. But you want to catch those Pokemons. This is an example of like a effective user interface for a messaging system, or at least a mock-up of a messaging system, where um, you post something and then someone else can go ahead and like or comment or, or flag as inappropriate. So you might think that, yeah, except for being ugly and things, it's not necessarily all that bad as far as user interfaces go. But once you put it in the right screen, you realize that targeting those buttons means that when I actually want to like something, I probably flag it as, flag it as inappropriate. So it's super important when you do look at your user interfaces that you do look at them in the right context. And this, like, especially like if you look at things like the scanner, it has to be in the context of someone actually going around shopping and maybe in, in a dark room or, um, yeah, basically putting it in the right context. So the traps here is basically a physical challenge and also something called accidental activation. So meaning that I was trying to put a like, push the like button, but I got the, the flag as inappropriate. I think this is the, the epitome of the accidental activation. Um, how many of you have taken a screenshot and accidentally shut off your phones? <laughs> yeah, so um, there is there's even a website talking about how to take screenshots. I think that kind of explains the issue with screenshots. But um, this is, of course, accidental activation because it's really hard to push them at the same time and not manage to do the power off. Uh, and it's also an invisible element, which means that you're not necessarily, like, at least me, I don't remember if it's like power and volume down or was it home button or, I mean, I, especially because I change phones a lot. So, that's the trust. And one thing you see here is that sometimes there are multiple traps in one single problem. There's usually one that's the more problematic one. And if you fix that root problem, the other one will go away too. So don't worry if there are multiple, you just fix the one and, and the other one will probably go away. Responsiveness. Um, there was um, a conference I think 2009 or something, where Google and Bing um, did a user um, research project where they introduced latency on their search. So what they did was basically you search for something and then they decided to introduce like a, a, a thousand milliseconds latency, so one second latency f until you get the response back. And it turns out that when you add when they added about a thousand milliseconds of latency, the click rate went down by 1.9%, and the revenue per user, like ad revenue per user, went down by 2.8%. And if you added another bit of latency, it went down like it escalates very, very fast. And you've probably been in this situation where you go to a website, it's performing slowly, and then you kind of like, you just lose concentration and you don't even remember why you were there in the first place, and you go to the next tab, and you forget about that website, and suddenly that responsibility, that respons bad responsiveness has lost them, you as, as a customer. So responsiveness is um, really, really important for, for a good user interface. Now, anything that is considered fast to do like beeping, should be, you should get an immediate response. And if something takes a little bit longer, let's say it's, it's taking more than uh, around half a second, you should always have some kind of feedback like a spinner or something. And if it takes more than one to two seconds, that feedback has to be continuous. So it needs to continuously tell you what it's doing or that something is happening. Because if you just pop up the spinner, then people are eventually going to things, think that things are hung. 
Um, efficiency is also um, kind of divided into four different sections. So the first one uh, being information overload. So this is how you find a Jeep, a Jeep dealer. So this is in uh, 2002, they had this way to find a Jeep dealer. Lots and lots of text. Some of this text is um, it's actually step-by-step -step instructions, but because of the way it's formatted, it's impossible to read. So this text takes you a good few minutes to read, which kind of delays you in, in actually performing the task. If you do happen to read it, most people probably wouldn't. So they fix this um, kind of by by putting bullet points and things and making it more readable so it's faster for you to scan. And then finally they fixed it and went kind of all Google on the thing. And this was the only thing that was needed. Like all this extra information about how to do things was something that just delayed you as a user. So think about this, like whenever you're um, kind of putting tons and tons of instructions in there, Consider if maybe there is something that you could do to do all these things for the user instead of having them read all the instructions and fill things in, because it really does change the complexity of using the system. This is the xbox.com website um, asking, hey, do you want to buy an Xbox uh, and Halo? And then in my recent activity, there is me playing Xbox, or me playing Halo on the Xbox One. <laughs> you've been there, right? You've seen these ads for things you've already bought and the system should know you already bought them. Why is it asking you for information that you already gave? This is called system amnesia, because even computers can be can have amnesia. Or this one, um, supposed to be a thing that helps your efficiency by autocorrecting things. But I find that in any given sentence that I write, I probably end up correcting the autocorrect one, two, three, four times before it finally gets what I'm trying to say. So if you're going to do a prediction, make sure it's a good prediction. Um, an example of this is, for example, when, when you have a website and you're going to select, like asking the user to say, select the country that you're in. Especially, like, I guess if you're in Australia, that's really nice because you're in the top. But if you live in Sweden, it kind of sucks having to scroll through 128 countries before I get to Sweden. It should be predicting, like, given the geolocation I'm in, it should be fairly easy to predict what I'm going to say about what country I'm in. The next three, forgiving, discrete, and protective, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about, actually. But um, let's go to the habituating one. Um, so think back to the first time you drove a car. And if you haven't ever driven a car, you just pretend that you drove a car. Um, or that you played the guitar here or something. So the first time you drove a car, at least my experience, um, was that it was super hard. There are a lot of things to remember the first time you drive a car. Like anything from how you kind of turn the key to, man, okay, so the right one is the gas, or which one is the brake, uh, I can't remember. And then at the same time, you have to kind of fix up your share, fix up the mirrors, and remember all the stop signs and all the, the other traffic signs. And, and then there are other people on the street, too, that kind of destroy everything for you. So there is a lot of stuff to think about, like the first time you drive your car. If you think back to the last time you drove a car, it was probably something that went pretty automatic. Like you can solve like super hard equations in the car while driving. And you probably don't even notice like most of the um, stop, well, the stop signs, hopefully, but um, <laughs> other random things that are going on on the side of the car. But what would happen if you had two sets of pedals? 
would it be easier or would it be harder to drive a car? I would say that it would definitely be harder because not only do you, like, it would seem like more efficient because you have more uh, stuff to use, but you have to always make a decision about whether you should use one or the other. And always thinking, man, if I would have used the other one, would that have been more? Like, would, have, would that have been better, more efficient? Or did I lose something here? Why is there even two options to do this one thing? And what would happen if, whenever you drove like north-south, you would have the pedals one way, and then when you drive east-west, the pedals suddenly change. Mm. Like they put the OK cancel button, like in, yeah. That would be horrible. So um, these things are kind of uh, expressed as gratuitous redundancy, like having multiple ways to do the same thing, or a variable outcome when pushing the same pedal suddenly gives a different outcome. All of these are things that makes it not habituating. So this is Facebook. Um, how do you send a private message to someone? And don't use the Messenger app. It's like in the actual Facebook ID. Turns out that there is one, two, three, four, 14, like I haven't bothered to put them all on there, 14 ways to send a private message to someone just from the Facebook ID. Which one is better? And whenever your friends ask you, so how do you send a private message, which one do you explain to them? I have no clue why they put all these ways to create private messages in here. And I think the fact that there is a separate messenger app kind of explains that there was a problem that needed to be solved somewhere. So in your apps or in your applications, um, from the same place, don't give the user multiple ways to perform the same task. Having said that, there are places where you do want to have some redundancy. Like for example, um, if you think about a phone, uh, it's nice if you can go, in, go into like the contacts and from there start a conversation or from the phone um, button and go in and select a contact from there and make the phone call like that. But in that case, it's okay because you go in with different purposes in the sense like once you started off wanting to make a call and then you decided who you wanted to make that call to or in the second case, you wanted to communicate with this particular person and you selected to do that by using a phone call. So it's okay to have some redundancy, but from the same screen, it's usually very bad for habituating purposes to have multiple ways to do something. Like in this case, how do you get to room number 3600? Here or here? Both? But yeah, you understand what I'm talking about. Um, variable outcome, you know, like when the pedals suddenly change places. So this is um, Windows Phone 7, where if you push the search button, it went to Bing to search. Unless you're in, um, in a first party app like email, in that case, it would search email. So unless you actually knew what the first party app was and which ones were considered first party apps, you had no clue whether the search button was going to take you to an in-app search or Bing, which means that you're less um, inclined to use it. This is called variable outcomes. So they fixed this later by putting the search button in the apps and making uh, the search always go to Bing or, or Cortana in later cases. Um, this is iOS, an early version where uh, text messages or email, how do you create a new text message or a new email? Well, this is how you create a new text message and this is how you create a new email. Would have been nice if the button was always in the right place. So having the button in, in, in the same place creates like muscle memory 
And that's kind of what you want to achieve. That's what makes you not think about the UI, but actually just perform your task. Um, that's an inconsistent fundament. And in this case, they actually fixed it a little bit, put it in the same location, but they managed to change it so that one still has like the edit looking button, and then one has the new keyword. So again, something that just stops you that extra second, thinking, is this the same thing? Is this what I want to do? OK, so, but it does kind of delay um, and make you think about the user interface in a way that you should never have to think about the user interface. The sense of home just means that uh, you shouldn't have multiple starting points. Uh, it's nice to always have, for example, one start screen that no matter what task you're supposed to perform, you can always go back to that start screen and find your way, like trigger your way down. Instead of, for example, on the, on the Xbox 360, there was the start screen, and then if you push the, the Xbox button, it would pop up like the system screen. And unless you knew which options you had to fix in the system screen and which ones were on the home screen, it's kind of hard to figure out like even where to begin looking for something. So these were some of the, the traps. And um, there is a website called uitraps.com that kind of lists them all. Uh, it's not actually, like it's some third party that just wanted to list them all. So you listed them all if you, if you want to go in and look at what they are. The way I use this is um, I go through and uh, when I, whenever I'm reviewing a user interface, I will look at three or four common areas uh, or common scenarios that I want to kind of review. And these should be like the things that you expect someone to do all the time. Because these are the ones that you want to focus on. You can't focus on like the whole user interface, but you can focus on the things that they will do like 80% of the time. So for example, on the phone, take a picture. And then you go through all the ways that you could do this task. So taking a picture on, on a phone could be done, for example, from the Photos app, using a camera button, um, or going in and uh, sliding up on, on the iPhone and pressing the camera button there. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. And you walk through, or you have a user walk through all of them. And then you identify and log any traps that you observe. So anytime they say something that kind of doesn't match up to the sentences that were listed in the beginning, um, I kind of try to figure out, OK, so was there a slow or no response? OK, so we need to look at that and see if, if that's something we want to fix. And if you can't find a trap, at least try to identify the area that was failing, like so the tenant that was failing. And then finally, um, document and do like a group discussion with your team to figure out which ones you actually do want to bother fixing. Because in a case, for example, with the, with the Apple TV remote, even though there was a trap, it's not necessarily something that you do want to fix by putting a button on there. Um, instead, you might want to fix it by the first few times kind of showing an on-screen hint about what you should be doing or something. Or maybe not even care about it at all, because some traps, even though they do exist, are not important enough to, to spend time on or, or risk deterring other parts of the user interface for. But this is the way like I do this. Um, normally, when I do this with customers, I'll spend like three hours or something with them. And that's usually enough to go through the main scenarios and get people's minds thinking about um, how you could fix it and make a substantially better user interface. Um, or in the words of um, Bill Buxton, we have to uh, adopt an approach that makes us first get the right design, like the right features, but also get the design right. So make sure the user interface kind of matches and makes um, <laughs> makes the most use of the features. I'm Tess, work for Microsoft. I'm a developer and a designer. And I hope that this last hour has um, given you some tools and maybe some ideas on, on how to create better user interfaces. Thank you.
We have time for a few questions if you guys want. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it used to be very much. Um, so the question was, what are my thoughts on uh, the metro or the previously known as metro um, not being very colorful? <laughs> uh, and my answer to that is that. Um, in the Windows 8 and Windows 8 era, it was very prescriptive. In the sense, like, you almost had to do something a certain way to get approved in the store. It's not like that anymore, I think. I, and, I, and so I think you have a lot of room to put in your own branding and to, put, to make it um, what you want it to be. So um, the fact that the, the original templates are not very colorful should not um, should not make you not create a colorful template. So I think, in fact, you should try to stray away as much as possible from the templates, still keeping in mind like the cleanness and and um, you know the grid. Um, when I say the grid, I don't mean like the squares. I mean like that things are actually properly aligned and things. Um, yeah, keeping things clean. I think that's you should look at the principles, but not necessarily feel bound by them. But yeah, that's for the, basically for anything, whether it be the Windows design language or, um, or Android or iOS or anything really. Yes. Uh, how do you decide which ones are worth fixing and which ones are not? So as a comparison, we have the printing button which is hidden in the logo menu, mm -hmm. which was fixed, while for the TV remote, which was kind of not fixed. So how do you decide which ones are worth fixing, which are not? So um, how do I decide what's worth fixing or not? It depends a lot on what um, the design goal of the system is. So in the case of um, in the case of the Apple TV, for example, I can't tell why they chose to fix or not fix, but I can I can think that the reason why they don't change that is because it's easy to find other ways to get people to understand what to do, and once they do understand what to do, then it's not a problem anymore. So it depends on how critical the issue is. In the case of um, of Word, I think it was very hard to to get someone unstuck in the whole file print thing, because you've conditioned them for so long to think about file print, that it's uh, this idea of like having removing the file button it was turned out to just be a bad idea. Listen, it depends on, on how critical the features are and how easy it is for people to discover them anyways. Um, so the question was, do I, um, do I use different colors in different regions? Are you talking about geographically? Yeah, it was a general question about, as an example, the color. But mm -hmm. it could be anything else, uh, so as a Microsoft. So do you differentiate between, like, in this region, this, this might have a different impact to the, the result of the design, and another region might have a different impact? Yeah, so I, I, I do think that if you're creating global software, which most people are, then you need to be mindful of, of how things are viewed in different areas, of course. Probably the color, because color means different things in different areas, but also like the iconography and things like that is very important. So yeah, definitely. What you need to look at is essentially, um, given a subset of your users, like a real subset that kind of includes um, most of the people you want to address, then they are the ones who, are, who eventually will have to say what is a good or what is a bad interface, if you will. I, I know that question, the answer was like a bit weird. But for example, at Microsoft specifically with Windows, um, right now there is a lot of feedback coming in through the Insider program through from all over the world. 
and and that's uh, taken seriously in terms of like fixing UX flaws in, in the system and other flaws, of course. Okay, yeah, one more, and then I will stop. Uh, so I've been involved in a project in, uh, where we got through the UX team, and there was like a lot of people sitting around the table having major arguments about the user experience. And what I found was that the people with the strongest personality or the more senior people <coughs> are the ones that ended up getting mm -hmm. away. How do you get around that? So the question is, how do I get around um, the, the people with the strongest opinions getting their way in the UX discussion. I think the same way you get around people having the strongest opinion about what framework you're using in, in your system. So go back to basics. What is it that is important for this? In this case, um, in, in an order ordering system, it's important for the sellers to be able to perform, like to be able to create an order in as minimal amount of time as possible while having a customer on site. That's what should govern like how your UX should look, not what someone internally thinks. Okay, thank you guys so much.